Uh, our final panelist is Norman Abrahamson, who is an adjunct professor of civil and environmental engineering, and he is also uh, one of the state's foremost experts on seismic hazard analysis. He has consulted on a variety of projects, hundreds of projects, actually many of them in California, projects including uh, seismic analysis for nuclear power plants, dams, the BART transportation system, San Francisco Airport, and many others, so we're very happy to have Norman here. Thank you. Um, I will see if I can make the five-minute challenge, uh, uh, keeping the uh, talk short. Question being, will our infrastructure survive? Um, I'd like to start out by um, correcting probably uh, the, some of the key misunderstandings that's been in the news in the last few weeks from the Japan earthquake. And I'll begin by saying here on the top, we design for ground motions, not earthquake magnitudes. Now that sounds a little circular because we consider the magnitude in coming up with the ground motion, but um, that, that's important to understand. So when we say, what if we have a magnitude nine here? That's not my concern. My concern is what if we have very strong ground shaking or with tsunamis, a very high tsunami. Uh, high. There are two approaches we use uh, to get at, at ground motions. A deterministic approach where we pick an earthquake, like a magnitude 8 on the San Andreas. We pick the closest distance, so we say it's as close to our site as it can be. But then we choose a ground motion level that is not the worst case. Okay, And so one of the things when I teach uh, seismic hazard, I emphasize to the students over and over, we do not design for the worst case. Okay, we need to stop using that word. We design for something that is, has a small enough chance of occurring that we're going to have an acceptably small risk. That's kind of a very, you know, a, sort of a wishy-washy statement, but that's what's happening. The probabilistic approach is something that tries to really take on that, 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 that risk number more directly and say, I'm going to design for a ground motion, for example, that has one in a thousand chance of occurring in a, uh, in a given year. Okay, so now you can say, once, you're, once you've said that, you've, you've recognized that you now are not designing for the worst case. There is something higher that could occur, and we're trying to find something that's acceptably rare. The key feature in all of this is variability of ground motion. And so this is a plot of the, the uh, ground motion data um, uh, that was mentioned earlier, all the stations in, in Japan. This is the stuff that came out very quickly. Uh, on the x-axis is the distance away, so this is at 50 kilometers is right along the, uh, the shoreline there above the rupture, 100 kilometers away and so forth. The y-axis here is the spectral acceleration. This is shown at a, a period of one second. And these are all of the data that were there. What you see is at a given distance away from the rupture, even in close, there's about a factor of 10 variability in the strength of shaking. And we've seen this over and over. As we get more data, in California earthquakes, a very similar thing. When we're uh, in close, we see about a factor of 10 variability or more a range of what the ground motion could be. Okay? So where are you going to design? We don't design up here at the very top levels. The curves I'll just show you here were actually the curves that were developed for predicting this magnitude 9 subduction earthquake up in Cascadia, what we, would have, what we would have predicted before this earthquake occurred, and we would have generally been not too bad close in, but we would have over-predicted by factors of 3 or 4 the ground motion at larger distances, and this is where we really need to improve these subduction models. They have not had nearly the same amount of effort as, as we've had on, on our earthquakes, for example, from the Hayward and the Calaveras Fault. So variability is king. Okay, in trying to figure out if your building is going to be safe, if your structure was getting this kind of ground motion, it may be failing, this kind of ground motion, nothing might be happening, it might be perfectly functional. So, um, you don't need to, I won't go through these numbers, but when you talk about infrastructure, these are examples of projects that I've been involved with in the Bay Area in terms of what are we designing for, what is rare enough. And there's a mixture of whether we've chosen deterministic approaches where we pick an earthquake and design for a median ground motion, meaning half the time it's higher than that, okay? An 84th percentile, which we consider really robust, which means one out of six times it's going to be higher than that when that earthquake occurs. These are not worst case, okay? And, and we don't do worst case 
because we can't afford to spend that much money on, on every project. You'll see numbers where when we do probabilistic numbers, toll bridges like the Bay Bridge, we look at a number of 1 in 1,500 uh, annual chance of occurring. When we're looking at dams, it might be anywhere from 1 in a few hundred to 1 in 10,000. Most of them are around uh, a couple thousand years. Other parts, like the, the BART tube, one in a thousand, I run and ride that um, frequently, and I think about that, that hazard as I'm going under the BART tube. Uh, <laughs> pipelines are important. You know, gas and water is important. We're designing numbers around one in 500 to one in a thousand for our major pipelines. That means there's a chance we could have something exceed it. Okay? When a big earthquake happens, will our infrastructure survive? The answer is some of it will, probably the majority, but quite a bit won't, and things will be damaged, and that's, that's what we've accepted. Uh, the issue of nuclear power plants was discussed. We generally are at about 1 in 10,000 level for, for nuclear power plants. Um, back to what matters. Why, don't we, why am I not so concerned about magnitude, okay, and what can cause big ground motion? beyond design basis. So if it's below the design basis, we assume the building will perform as intended or the structure will perform as intended. If it's beyond that, that's where we start to get into trouble. So again, looking at the data just from Japan, this, this is the large variability we get here you know, um, just from uh, randomness in the process, where you're located and so forth. On the right-hand side is the scaling with magnitude for the same value, spectral acceleration, this is from the California-based uh, NGA models for ground motion. And if we look at the, the scaling, let's say, as we went from magnitude 7 to magnitude 8, there's a factor of 30 increase in energy release, but the ground motion goes up by less than a factor of 2. Okay, the ground motion doesn't scale nearly as much. Compare that to, ah, this is sensitive, to this large <laughs> variability we could get from a single size earthquake. That is, you're much more likely to get beyond, beyond design basis ground motions from a rare, uh, a rare ground motion from a regular size earthquake than you are from getting a very unusually large earthquake. Okay? Now, when we think about that, so that's what I just said, but big magnitudes have another impact for us. At a particular site, I'm more worried about the, the more frequent size earthquakes, but rare uh, energetic shaking. But big earthquakes affect a large area. That really impacts our whole emergency response. Um, can't, we can handle a, a smaller earthquake like you can handle a storm and things like that. You've got the manpower to repair it and to deal with it. Big earthquakes can, can, can affect hundreds of kilometers of areas, uh, lengths of faults when we have a big rupture. And now do we have the manpower? Do you have the, the, the capability to even respond to that? So that's really the key. At the end, we're talking about what is the capacity of structures and, and our infrastructure to withstand beyond design basis ground motion. And that is really, we talk about margin. This is back to what uh, Steve was talking about. How far over do you put that, push that capacity curve? Really, we, in infrastructure, we typically don't actually evaluate this. In my opinion, we need to start doing that. What have we bought? What is the system really gonna uh, behave as? In the nuclear business, where I spend probably half of my time, this is what we do. Everything is pushed to beyond design basis to try to see what could happen, what could go wrong, and I think we need to start to do that more. So will our infrastructure survive? Um, some will, some won't, and we have to just accept that kind of variability is going to occur. Thank you. <laughs>